Okay, thank you. So my name's AC Fuller, uh, and I just want to say something really quickly about this conference before we get going. I joined this Facebook group of 20 books when there was, I think, 900 people in it. And I've, this is the third year I've been at the conference out of three, and it's really remarkable to see the growth, both of the Facebook group, all of the ancillary Facebook groups, and of this conference. So huge thanks to Craig and all the volunteers who make it go. It's really remarkable how this has grown. And of course, to the great panelists and authors from all genres who come and make it as good as it is. And so with that, let's get straight to them. This is the Thriller Suspense panel. Uh, and I would like to first ask each of the four of you to introduce yourselves and your books just with a sentence or two. Most of you don't need introductions. I don't want to do a whole bio. People can Google you. But who are you? What do you write? Since I have custody of the microphone, which was a mistake, they shouldn't have given that to me. I'm Christine Catherine Rush, but I write mysteries under Chris Nelscott as well as Christine Catherine Rush. Chris Nelscott is an international best-selling and Edgar and Seamus Award nominated mystery writer. Um, and uh, there's a long story behind why Chris Nelscott exists. Uh, Christine Catherine Rush, my real name, um, I write uh, every genre, and uh, that includes mystery, and under that I am an Edgar-nominated short story writer, so. so. I'm Mark Dawson, I'm the author of the John Milton, Beatrix Rose, and Isabella Rose series, and also sell courses and teach authors how to do the shit that I do. Thank you. <laughs> How do I follow that, right? <laughs> so um, I'm Diane Capri. I write mystery, thriller, and suspense. I'm probably best known for my Hunt for Jack Reacher series. Um, I also write uh, a, series, a bunch of other series, and hopefully you've heard of some of them. I appreciate that, <laughs> since I have to follow him and all. Hi. <clears throat> my name is Matthew Mather. I kind of write... Uh, I came out of the science fiction world, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, and uh, kind of moved into the... The thriller realm, uh, my most famous book is Cyberstorm, which was translated into, I've lost track of how many languages, through 24 or something. Um, I'd had a lot of success getting books optioned by 20th Century Fox and a whole list of other companies, but nobody so far has made one into a film yet, so I'm looking for some help on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you, great to be here. You can just keep the microphone. So with about 10 minutes to go, we'll have some questions up here. So think about your questions uh, if you want to ask one to one of the panelists or to all of them. Um, go back to when you were writing your first book, not necessarily your first published book. Is there something that you wish you could tell yourself to stick on your computer, on your typewriter, in your notebook, advice you would give yourself now, given that you're all very experienced, that would have been useful to your younger self as you wrote your first book? And Anyone can speak to it. I'll, since I've got the microphone, I'll go first. Um, I, I think the most important thing is that to be a writer, you have to write. And I think I would stick a thing on my wall saying, make sure you get up and write as much as you can all the time. I mean, that's the most important thing uh, for me. My very first novel, actually, was a, was a real mishmash called Atopia that actually ended up being kind of a mini plot with like a whole bunch of like six different stories all interconnected, which I would never try and do ever again. But it's one of the books that so I just had somebody came up to me today and said, I loved Atopia. It was my, one of my favorite books of all time. So it's really hard to tell. I don't think there's any, um, uh, any, any formulas for how to, to, to come up with a, with a great book except follow your passion and things that you're really interested in and, and write stuff that you're interested in. Um, I got some great advice when I was writing my first book from um, Michael Conley at a conference. And what he said was, you can't really judge your own work. Um, and especially you can't judge your own work when you're writing it. So as I was writing my first book, just about every day I would think, well, this is a piece of crap. <laughs> Same. And so it was really helpful to me to hear somebody as experienced and successful as he was to say that. So my advice to my younger self would be just write the darn book, you know, start now, get through, get to the end, and then you can figure out whether it's any good or not. But if you don't write it, you'll never know, and it's not something you can judge for yourself. Um, I had a slide on this yesterday, but Craig made me take it out because I didn't have time to get into the, the, the full hour. So for me, the only time I've ever had trouble writing was I'd had a couple of books traditionally published that didn't do very well. And then I decided I was going to try and... Um, I was My editor published an Australian author called Matthew Riley, who writes kind of fun, 
propulsive fiction. And I thought, that's easy, I can do that. And there's a big market for it, he, he'd got good advances. And so I thought I'd give that a try. And apart from realizing that it wasn't easy um, and I couldn't do it very well, uh, it was the only time I've ever had an, a problem with opening my laptop and, and writing. And the reason for that, and I had a slide on this yesterday, was what I try to do now and the advice I'd give is if you think of a Venn diagram with the one circle on the left being what you like to write, one circle on the right being what the, you think the audience might like as well. You've got to find that sweet spot where the two um, circles intersect. That's what I try and do now. Um, I, what I was doing back in those days was writing something that I thought the, the audience wanted, but it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to write. And as a result, the, the book was terrible um, and you know, never, never really saw the light of day. So that's what I'd say, keep an eye on that sweet spot. Well, I'm a little different, I think, from everybody else on the panel because I grew up wanting to be a writer and I wrote my first book when I was seven and I cannot get it away from my sister. She still has a copy of it and I don't and I'm afraid she's going to blackmail me with it at some point. Um, I wrote my second book when I was like 10. Um, it was fan fiction um, and then another one when I was 14. So I think what I would tell my, my younger self was I was writing what I loved and I would say, you're on the right road, kid. Keep doing it. Um, just write for yourself and have fun. And I think that's what I would say. So we're mostly marketing focused here, but I did pull the 20 books thriller uh, group and they wanted a little bit of craft stuff from you guys. So I want to ask, this is a question multiple people wanted me to pose. What are the craft mistakes you see newer writers making consistently? Or if you're willing to share the craft mistake you made most consistently early on in your career that you have now fixed, hopefully or not. Um, but what are the craft things? Uh, and if you can be specific to genre, whether you're you know, writing big techno thrillers or mysteries or whatever you're writing, can you be specific to genre about the craft stuff you see going wrong, either in you or in books you read? Um, I have an entire panel called The Destructive uh, Pursuit of Perfection later this afternoon, and I will be dealing with a lot of this at that point. But That's you asked great. specific to genre. Um, and so what I see is that a lot of people don't read the genre they claim to be writing in. You have to read it, you have to love it. Most people seem to think mystery is Agatha Christie. It's not, it's crime fiction. Um, and so start reading it, um, all permutations of it, from the cozy all the way up to the suspense thriller, and see where you fit. <laughs> Mistakes, I've made a few. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think one important thing, um, if you're building like a complex world that, that uh, setting something up, so some, in some of my books I set up fairly complex worlds that I then destroy usually, but you need to um, choose the proper through line. Like you need to think about the characters you're picking and make sure those characters are gonna explain the world and it's the proper through line for how you're gonna explain that um, and have everything happen. I don't know if that makes sense, but sometimes with the choice of characters I have made <laughs> one time, once or twice, I've made mistakes of not quite picking the proper through line to explain the universe properly that I was building up, and um, and that's just something to to think about. Okay, another craft question. Most of the people in here are writing, or will write, or are planning to write a series, probably with a central series character that is kind of the through line of that series. If I locked you in a room and said, create a series character. Uh, in the next 48 hours, 72 hours, a week. Uh, don't tell me who the character is. How would you approach it, trying to create a new series character, whether it's a detective or a crime solver, action hero, whatever that is. How do you approach that from a craft perspective to do something you're interested in, something readers will love, and so on? So I'm not asking you to create one. Tell us how you would do it. When I, when I, um, if I'm looking for a new series character, I always try and create, obviously, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious, but some unique characteristics, some unique skill that they have in some way. Obviously, you know, in, uh, when we're talking about thrillers or crime fiction, I think you need to be, have characters that are flawed. It's the flaws that make them interesting, um, and then, but they also have some unique characteristic that they're only they're going to be able to use that skill or that thing to, to push through towards, uh, towards the end. I mean, that's the way that I think about it. I want a series character that I am going to be willing to spend a lot of time with <laughs> because it is going to take me a long time to write this series I've, and I'm going to be hours and hours, days and days, books and books writing about this person, whoever it is. So as I'm creating him or her, um, it, it, it either has to be a person that I'd at least be willing to have to my house for dinner 
you know. Um, but ideally, somebody that I would be friends with or would enjoy hearing about, I don't want to be bored when they're talking to me, you know, and I don't want you to be bored when they're talking to you. So, so the first thing for me is it's got to be an interesting person and a person that I like, even if, I mean, obviously they have flaws because if they don't, then they're not interesting characters, but, um, but they have to be, I mean, I can't write an entire series based on a villain you know, or, or a despicable human being, or, you know, a, a, I don't know, a dog hater, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I like dogs, so, you know. So, so that's the first thing. It has to be somebody that I want to spend a ton of time with, and I hope that you will want to spend a lot of time with when you read it as well. But if I don't want to spend time with them, then I figure there's no chance you're going to want to spend time with them. Well, I'm doing this at the moment, so I've got a new, I'm writing a new book um, called The House in the Woods, which features a new character called Atticus Priest. It's a private detective, uh, used to be a police officer based in Salisbury, where, where I am. And um, for me, I, I don't write, I think I kind of discover him as I write. So I, I'm, you know, I've probably done 110,000 words now, so coming to the end of, of the book. And his, his character has developed as I've grown to know him a little bit through the writing of the book. Um, so I don't have a formula for that. I also, th in, the, in this book and in this series, there'll be a female detective who still works for the police. They had an affair, he had to leave. He's kind of a cross between Sherlock Holmes and House, which I guess is actually, that is Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and and, and th these two will, will kind of spark off each other. And in the process of defining their relationship, I've, I've learned about both of them to the extent that I'm quite com comfortable with, with how they both are now. And again, like, you know, like, like Diane, I want to spend some time with them, and, and I hope that you guys and, and readers will want to spend time with them too. I always feel out of place at, at, when there's questions like that because I'm a very organic writer, and I don't think about you know, what needs... I, I remember reading how Lee Child chose Jack Reacher and how he made all those decisions. You know, and he's a very analytical writer. My husband is as well, and I am not. Um, so you'd put me in a room for 45 minutes to develop a series character, and I would sit down and write it. Although I would take probably 30 minutes of that 45 minutes as I'm getting started to pick the right name. Because you're living with the name for a long period of time, and there's two factors to the name, uh, what the name is, and how easy it is to type. Because <laughs> you're going to be typing it a lot. <laughs> That's probably why he chose Jack for Jack Reacher. While you have the microphone, so one question the Facebook group threw out at me was, if you could talk at all about craft differences between genres, so some folks who are writing uh, mysteries versus maybe they want to write techno thrillers too, are there any craft differences you can speak to between genres? And that's for everyone, but since you have the mic and write in multiple genres, I know it's kind of a tough question, but if anything leaps to mind, we'd be interested in that. The difference, well, you were asking, you know, between genres, but, yeah, and, but, but you're like talking between, about subgenre? I mean subgenres, yeah. Sub so I don't mean between romance and thriller, but between subgenres. Yeah, sub okay, genres, because yeah. between genres, it's the ending that, right. that yes. differentiates your genre. Um, but uh, with everything else, with subgenres, it's, it's a lot more murky. Um, I mean, and I teach an entire mystery class, and Dean and I have one online too about you know the differences in subgenres. But when you're starting to get to from cozy to soft boiled, soft boiled to hard boiled, um, it's the character in there. Uh, cozy, they don't want any blood. Um, you know, noir. Oh man, the world is a horrid place, and let's confirm that. Um, you know, so you have to kind of. That's why I tell you to read a lot because once you start reading a lot, you're going to see what the differences are. But they're murky, and so, you know, if, it, if your book isn't working as a cozy, maybe you wrote a soft-boiled, because you have a detective in there, or a private detective, or something. So, you know, experiment. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I only really write one particular subgenre, so I'm not, not one for me. Yeah. Um, I think one big difference between um, mystery and thriller is pacing. Um, pa mystery is a slower paced story, generally speaking, um, and thrillers are faster. And people pick up a th thriller to read, they're expecting a page turner. So maybe Tom Clancy can get away with describing how to build a submarine, but most of us really can't, you know? We really have to keep the pages going. So the craft aspects of that come into play. You know, um, I was talking to, there was a screenwriter yesterday that I was talking to out in the atrium, and we were talking about this, and I call these cheap tricks. And he said, Diane, those are not cheap tricks, those are techniques. 
<laughs> so for thrillers, I use cheap tricks. I write short words, short sentences, short paragraphs, short chapters. I end with a cliffhanger. I want them constantly to keep going. So it's, it's kind of a breathless pace. Now, yes, you take a break here and there. But, you know, that helps to make it a thriller. And if you look at reviews on my books, they'll say, you know, this book kept me up all night. I couldn't quit reading this book. It was, you know, it was over way too soon. And I'm like, it's 110,000 words. How much do you want? You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, but a mystery is very different from that. A mystery is kind of Sherlock Holmes, even if it's Benedict Cumberbatch, you know. They sort of wander around and they sort of look at the clues and they sort of think about things. And, you know, maybe they stop for a, you know, fancy dinner. And, you know, and then eventually they kind of cerebrally kind of figure it out. Whereas, you know, in the thriller, it's, there's always a big explosive ending, sometimes literally. Um, and, you know, so the pace is just very different, I think, in those genres. And it's good to keep that in mind. Great answer. That's really helpful. <clears throat> if I'm if I'm writing a thriller, I think the the one thing that I always keep in mind when you're writing a thriller is there needs to be a fate worse than death. Like if it's an adventure story or even maybe a mystery, maybe if the, the main character doesn't want to die or wants to stop somebody from dying, but in a thriller it needs to be a fate worse than death. Like it needs to be not only would you die, but the you know, the entire city's gonna blow up from an atomic bomb or, you know, uh, or your, you know, children are going to, you know, your own children might die, or so. There's something worse than than death that's driving the character that's going to end up doing something so extreme that they're going to go through something that that a normal human wouldn't be able to, perhaps, go through to 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 stop this fate that's that's just so terrible. So that's something I, I always keep in mind when I'm writing a thriller, or I try to think about it. I want to switch gears to talk about marketing a little bit. One of the things I love about this conference is that there are people with 50, 100, 200 books here, and there's people who are still working on their first book, and it's very democratic, and we're just all here together. I think it's one of the excellent things. So for those who are newer, who have zero books out, or maybe one book out, what's the one thing you would say, if they don't have all the marketing money or marketing kind of a force behind them, what's the one thing they have to do before their first book comes out? And maybe people even have books out, and they haven't done this, so they have to do it as well. The w if it's just one thing, the number one priority. Um, <clears throat> I think the hardest thing when I was writing my very first book was getting people to read the book and to give honest feedback that were not your family members or not people that you knew. Um, I accomplished this by putting an ad out on Craigslist and saying, listen, I'll give you 10 bucks if you read my book and give me, <laughs> and it worked. I got my first beta readers. I got like 30 people I didn't know at all were completely arm's length from me from all over North America. They read my book and gave me what I hope was, was honest feedback and that really helped sort of kickstart the whole uh, process of getting, um, of getting uh, honest feedback. I think the most important thing to keep in mind when you're writing at any level, whether it's your first book or your, you know, 101st, is um, to remember the reader and to think about what the reader is getting out of this. Is the reader going to, if it's a book, if it's what I write, you know, you want them to enjoy it, you want them to engage with it. You want, in my case, I want them to be immersed in it. I want them to sort of live in that book for the time that they're reading it and, you know, help me create the story in their head. Um, when I was writing my first book, I remember, again, going to conferences and uh, more experienced writers would say, you know, your reader's going to be unhappy about this and your reader's going to be unhappy about that. And I would think to myself, I'm probably not ever going to have any readers, so why do I care, <laughs> you know? And, and, of course, happily, that is not the situation. So I think just keep in, the biggest important thing is, you know, you have to write something that readers are going to want to read if if what you want to do is sell your book. I mean, a lot of people write for other reasons, but if you want to write to sell the book, you have to have something that people are going to want to read. So you have to keep thinking about, you know, what will the reader think of this? Will the reader like this? You know, I like it, of course. You know, obviously I wouldn't be writing it if I didn't. But, you know, can I make this more accessible? Can I make this more interesting? Um, you know, it's not very interesting if the, if the lead character is taking a shower, but could it be interesting if there's a snake in there? <laughs> you know, um, things like that. Uh, this is easy for me. So, mailing list. So, who here doesn't have a mailing list? I won't shame anybody. Oh, well, I've shamed you a little bit. Because um, there's actually not that many, but the, I'd say the, the most important thing, if you take one thing away from this conference, or well, you'll take lots of things, but an important thing will be to go and get a mailing list and get that set up. It is going to be the most important asset you have as a creative professional. Because um, you know, Amazon has, you have followers on Amazon, you have 
people who like your Facebook page, but none, no, those platforms are not going to give you that information. Um, Zuckerberg changes the rules all the time. So back in the day, organic reach was very high on Facebook, so you could post something and most of your followers would see it. These days, the percentage is about two, two and a half percent, if, if even as high as that. So you want to own, own that asset yourself so that when you have something new to release, for example, or you want to uh, rejuvenate backlist sales, you can then draft an email um, and send it out to them. I find that, that that is always the most powerful thing when I have a new release ready to go, and I can supplement that with other things, but that's an asset that I own. Um, and you know, say if Amazon stops selling books tomorrow, I can pivot, put everything on Apple, and then send my readers to Apple. I can't do that if I don't have a means of getting in touch with them. That's good advice. Um, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice on this. Uh, first, separate your writer brain from your business brain. Don't put your business in your writing. Um, write what you want to write and get it done. I mean, that's the key. You've got to finish what you write. And write a lot. So don't really focus on marketing until you've got, I mean, there's a different formula for everybody. If you're writing in a series, three to four. If you're not writing in a series, five or six. Um, and so make sure that, you know, maybe up to 10. Um, write, that should be your focus. But once you've finished writing, then you need to have a couple of things. First of all, you need to th start thinking like a reader. When you put your writer brain aside, think like a reader and say, what's the first question a reader asks when they close a book? Where can I get another book like this? So you need to be able to answer that question because they're going to come to you first. So we'll have a website. It can be a static website. And that they're going to look up your name, have that website come up, make sure that you have, you don't talk about your cats, make sure you're talking about what your next books are so they can find your next book and how to order it. And, you know, if you do simple things like that, even after your first book is out, just your first book, you answer those questions of, you know, what do I want to read next? How can I find it? Where can I find you? And they're going to stick with you. But if you don't answer that, and most writers don't, um, you're going to lose the reader right there because they're going to forget you by the time the next book comes out, whether it comes out two weeks later or comes out a year later. They'll forget. Keep them. Have them find you again. Help them pre-order if possible. Another marketing-related question. If you could think back to a time in your writing career when you leveled up. You already had, say, three books out, five books out, but you leveled up from maybe you're selling, I don't know, 1,000 copies of a, of a book to 10,000 copies or from 10,000 to 100,000 or from 100 to 500. Think about when you leveled up. Was there something you did marketing-wise that you can attribute that leveling up to? I know mailing list for Mark, maybe you used a bunch of Facebook ads to grow that mailing list from 1,000 to 20,000. I don't know. So is there something you did that really helped you take that step up? Because that's what most people here are trying to do, is level from where they are to the next level. Yeah, Facebook ads for me. I mean, there's, there's been a number of um, steps along the journey. But uh, for me, start of 2014, I started running Facebook ads. And there weren't many authors doing that in those days. And I had a few false starts. Um, I originally tried to drive traffic to, uh, to a book that was in KU to get KU reads, and that didn't really work. Um, I then kind of pivoted to um, price promos and box sets and, and that kind of thing. And I remember very vividly, because um, I'm not great at maths, um, and money doesn't grow on trees, at least I didn't think that it did. So um, I was uh, walking the dog one day, and I'd call my accountant, because I just wanted him to check the numbers that I was seeing. I was spending 100 pounds a day and making 400, and thinking that that can't be right. That's just much too good to be true. And Nick ran the numbers for me and basically said, "Look, you, you've basically you found a, a great big free ATM, and can I invest in your business, please?" <laughs> um, so it's not quite like that anymore. You, you're not going to get 400% return on investment these days because idiots like me have taught everyone else how to do it. Um, but it, it, it's that that kind of step for me was not just Facebook advertising generally treating my, my writing career as a business, advertising it, promoting it. That was when I went from doing pretty well to doing a little bit better. Anybody else want to answer that? Something that helped them level up in terms of sales? Other thoughts? Uh, marketing down the road. Uh, what do you see coming in the next one to three years in terms of changes in marketing? And specifically, if you think email is going to be the, still the most important, and all of us almost have email lists, are there changes coming to that? Or maybe your expertise is Facebook ads, AMS ads, or something we're not yet doing. What do you see coming that you're preparing for? 
I find it really frustrating when I'm sitting in a group of writers and all we're talking about is how to get more readers in publishing. Um, because we're working off the old traditional publishing model and not the indie publishing model. And uh, the traditional publishing never saturated the entire market. I mean, they don't even believe that people in rural areas read books because they don't deliver books to rural areas. Um, and they really fight hard against ebooks. And as you saw with Macmillan now, that they don't want to put books in libraries. I mean, how can you behave that way? Um, so I think. Uh, you know, talking about whether we do email lists or Facebook ads, yeah, that's important, but that's not really the direction that we should be looking. We should be looking at other businesses. Other businesses have had a long career of bringing customers in and introducing them to a product. And when you separate out your writer brain from your business brain and you start thinking about it, what you have is a product, okay? So how do you bring people to your product? You don't say, how do I bring readers to my book? How do I bring people to my product? Even if you know, you're bringing somebody in who isn't a reader, and they may never read your book, but their sister is a reader. And so they're going to buy your book as a gift for their, sis your, their sister. So you want to be able to get to all those people. And do I see what's coming? I think for the writers who are actually focused on the wider world, I think the sky's the limit. And there's a whole bunch of new technology. There's a whole bunch. I mean, today's news brought in the news that Nike is going to pull out of Amazon. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the big tech companies are going to start losing some stuff. And people are going to start going direct to the e-commerce site of, say, Nike, to buy Nikes. That has an implication for writers, because that means at some point you might be selling off your website. You have to start thinking about that from the bigger world and take the bigger world into the smaller world of publishing and be the person who is the innovator rather than the person who's the follower. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to look into the future, but I agree with um, what the, the other speaker is saying, that um, at some point Amazon might not be the only game in town, so doing things like keeping a, a big email list and keeping directly in touch with those people so that you're able to, to kind of move with the times and move with the platforms as they change, um, I think that's really important as we're looking to the future. But yeah, definitely mailing lists. That's been something I've put a huge amount of focus on, and I've done... Uh, a couple of collectives where I've brought together a few different, uh, like 10 or 12 different authors in the science fiction space and also in the thriller space where we share resources and we build up common mailing lists that we, uh, that we uh, share out between us. Uh, but mailing lists is, is a really big thing for the future or just to be able to stay in touch with your readers directly. I wonder if anyone has a thought, are, are uh, freebies, you know, novella prequels, that sort of thing, or as Mark pointed out yesterday, novella epilogue type stuff, additional content, is that the, still the number one way to build your list, the fastest and the best quality subscribers? That is such a hard question. <laughs> That's um, why they pay me the big money. I, I know, it really is. I mean, I do that, I give away um, a book uh, for people to join my mailing list, and I've been doing it for a long time. And the book that I give away, I also sell. Right. And surprisingly, it sells a lot, even though they can get it for free if they join my mailing list. Um, and it does work. It works well, and it, and it brings people to my list, and lots of times they stay there, So, and sometimes they even buy something, so that's good. Um, so, so yeah, I think, but then there's a whole, other, there's a lot of other ways to use free books, um, and it, people usually liken it to sampling, you know, you go to Sam's Club or Costco and they give you samples of sausage and then you buy a whole sausage, right? And, um, so it, it, they, li they liken it to that. F free first, uh, in a series has never worked very well for me, but I know people who have built their entire careers on it. So I think some of this stuff, you just sort of have to try it and see whether it works for you or it doesn't. But even if offering a free sample to join your mailing list doesn't work, then you have to figure out something else that does because I really feel like the ability to contact your reader directly is the biggest arrow in your quiver um, and the most important one. And so however you have to do it to get that to happen, that's, I mean, aside from, you know, dancing naked in the streets or something, I think you should definitely do. Uh, yeah, I think I, I said it yesterday. The, I think um, uh, free books as a sign up for people to join your list is very effective. I think epilogues might be better. Uh, it's also quicker to do it, to, to put an epilogue together, make it exclusive to that particular book. 
in, in terms of the hierarchy of subscribers, organic subscribers who have signed up because they love what they've just read will always be number one. So that you'll always have the highest open rates and the highest engagement rates with those kinds of subscribers. Um, Facebook subscribers can work quite well, especially if you um, if you're filtering them, so you're keeping an eye on how engaged they are and either moving them into separate parts of your list or, or removing them if they're not engaged. Um, personally, I, I'm not a massive fan of uh, list swapping because you, know, you get 10 authors all promoting something to their, their list. You could have readers ending up on nine different lists and that's that's a, those people are just gonna get swamped by email. So I, I don't do that. I've never done that with my readers and I don't, don't think it, I, it wouldn't work for me, I don't think. So that's, that, that's you know, they all work together though. In contests you can do don't give away shiny iPads, give away something that's related to reading because you don't want, everyone wants an iPad. Uh, maybe give away a, a, you know, something that is specific to your books. But just keep trying lots of different things and um, making sure that all of those sources are switched on and you, you know, just continue to grow your list. I have a bunch of mailing lists um, because I don't follow the advice that everybody has given about mailing lists. Um, I only want organic readers on my mailing lists. So people can choose. Um, I'm one of those readers that, you know, I like certain series by some writers, but I don't like the other series that they write. So they can choose whether they want to have something from my diving series or my Chris Nelscott books, or if they want everything. So I give different books away for depending on which list you sign up on. And if you sign up on all of them, you get a whole bunch of stuff. But if you sign up on Christine Catherine Rush, which is kind of my catch-all name, you'll get the first book or a short story in the series um, in a big omnibus that's only available through my newsletter because you get to sample all the stuff that I do of all the different types of things. Um, but that's kind of how I do it. I also give a free story away every Monday. It goes away the following Monday. And I cannot tell you how many loyal readers I have made from doing that um, and how many of them are people like I was when I was in college, I had absolutely no money. So having a free short story that they can read for nothing except logging on makes them loyal readers for life because I gave them a story when nobody else did. And I'm in control of what the free is. Um, I'm not putting it free on Amazon. Um, free on Amazon and other places stopped working somewhere around 2014 for most people. Um, and so, you know, because Amazon used to curate the free list and then they stopped. Um, and if you just have people like to pay for things, so 99 cents, $1.99, people see that as cheap and they're willing to jump into your series by paying just a little bit to, to try it or if making sure you're in Amazon Prime or doing all that other stuff. But, you know, curate your own free. Make sure that when you're doing free, you're the one in charge. That way they can't you know, monkey with you and some of the algorithms of other stuff and everything else. That's worked for me. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes. Love questions from the audience. If you want to come down to the microphone, uh, first come, first served here. Should have time, hopefully, for at least four or five. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hello again, Ms. Rush. This question is for you. So you said that you offer a free story to your readers every Monday and then you make it go away. So what feature are you using to, be, uh, to have that capability to give it to them and then if they are too late to show up and, and, and retrieve it or to, to grab it, uh, how are you setting that up through maybe a book funnel type feature where you can expire the page or is this your website or? It's my website. Work? It's on my website. It's called Free Friction Monday. It's the, I've had a website since the 1990s, because I was a science fiction writer, so, you know, um, and I, so I learned how to do it the old way. So what I do is I just put the story up on the website, and I take it down. Um, PDF? Or, and that's it. Or right. a, Mo a Moby download, or a PDF? No, they don't get to download it. Uh, I mean, they can. Oh, they can get it in email if they sign up for the RSS feed, but no, it is a standard web document. Web page, and that's it's a done web page. after a certain time on a page, not, yep. not a PDF download. Yeah. Okay. And okay. so if you get the email, the email doesn't go away. Right. You get the RSS feed, it doesn't go away. But if you, you know, go to my website, it says there was a free story here, but it's gone now. Look around and find the other free story. Yeah. Okay. You Thank make them you. take the action right away, which is interesting, rather than giving them a book funnel link with a, with a download. Yeah, they have it's to read it on the website yeah. or get the email. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, this is a question for everyone. Uh, thrillers, I think, have been the most popular genre, from what I understand, for quite a long time now. I'm wondering if you see that as continuing, and also how you see that developing further in terms of subgenres and other new developments. In the romance writers around here might yeah. might dispute that. I think. 
Well, I think statistically... Kalytics, that's what I was going for. I What's could that? be wrong about this, but I think statistically romance has outsold everything um, forever. Uh, last time I looked, it was like it had 49% of the market or something. But there's enough for us thriller writers to still, you know, do okay. So, so that worked out fine. Um, I think thrillers do sell well. I think that a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon and started writing them. I think the, the definition of thriller seems to be expanding. Um, people are writing things that they call sci-fi thrillers and, um, you know, um, fantasy thrillers and, um, you know, uh, several other different kinds. And that never used to be a thing. You know, a thriller was always a story in the here and now, you know. We didn't have paranormal thrillers, you know. So, so the definition seems to be expanding and the genre seems to be growing. Um, but uh, I think the types of books that are labeled with the thriller label seem, uh, uh, seem to be changing as well. So I, I think if that continues, then the, the genre will continue to grow because it, people as, as creative as writers are, you know, they'll think of other kinds of things to write, just like they thought to write what they're writing now. So yeah, I think it'll continue to grow and I think it'll still continue to be a large share of the market. I think the challenge then is to find people who want to read that, be whatever that is, you know, because some people um, like to read paranormal and some people don't. Do you know what I mean? So we have to figure out a way to, to reach the readers who want to read what we're writing in my view. So my question is, um, I hear it's all about the reader and a lot of these breakout sessions and establishing relationships with your readers. I'd like for the panel to take a moment and think back early, early in your career. Um, what direct marketing uh, event that you did or something, say, out of the box? I really like, Matthew, your out of the box Craigslist thing. That was awesome. So <laughs> if there's some singular event that you can think back like, wow, I went to this church bazaar and I sold a bajillion books, but it was a direct marketing event that each of you could think about that just was like, wow, that was way better than I thought. Um, <clears throat> the thing that worked for me way back, way back when was, um, actually, I, um, I, I talked to a lot of other writers and actually, I, I don't know if you've heard of Hugh Howey, probably a lot yeah. of you have heard of him. So Hugh and I became friends way back when, before Wool came out and and I spent time getting to know a lot of writers. And then when my first book came out, I, I impressed upon Hugh how it would be helpful. And he just blurbed and talked about it. And that sold me like thousands of books. So just being able to get someone significant who, you know, finding a way to, to reach out and make that connection, have somebody sort of help give you a hand up, um, that, that worked for me. That really that got my career started right off. So that was the network. Networking, yeah. That was a networking answer. But right. Is there an event that you can think of that you did uh, early in your career? I know it might take a little bit longer to think back that far when you were just starting out, but. I've done all sorts of reader events, and, um, I, and I've done radio and television and, uh, you know, book festivals and, you know, conferences and library talks. And one year I did book signings in the mall where, you know, they were selling Billy Bass and Pokemon cards. And, you know, then people were coming up to me at my table and saying, you know, which way to the bathroom. Um, so just about any way that you, you can get out there and meet readers is a good thing. But people buy books one at a time. And, and readers like you or don't like you one at a time. So to me, you know, you can give a talk to a room full of people and maybe you'll find, you know, some people to read your book. But if you talk to a person one-on-one -on -one and they like you and they think your book would be interesting, then they're going to give it a try. And if it is interesting, they're going to be dedicated to you for a long time. I have people reading my books now. Well, this... I did a book signing in a little town where my mother lives. It's a little tiny town, this little tiny library, and I did it about 15 years ago. And those people that I met then have read every single book that I have published since. Every single book that I have is in this library, whether it's indie or not. And people, there's a waiting list. So readers, if they like you, can be really, really loyal, and they'll read everything you write. Um, and those are the readers that I'm sort of looking for. I think David Gogren calls those super fans. I'll quickly add, I know we're running out of time, but I'll tell you one thing that didn't work for me. So I come from Salisbury in the UK. Now, you may or may not know there was a small incident l last year with Russians and poison and all that, which is, if you're writing espionage thrillers, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> so I was, um, the BBC got me on Breakfast News um, in the UK, so I flew up to Manchester and 
probably a million people would have watched me on the sofa in the morning. And I obviously I'm able to track how many copies of, of, of the books that sold. None. Not, not one. So either I was really bad um, or, um, or that just doesn't work anymore. So I, personally, I don't direct marketing. I think that's a concept from a few years ago. I would much rather apply digital techniques to reach readers at scale. It's much easier um, and you can have a, a much better effect. Good point. Um, I blog on the business a lot. I mean, I do that every Thursday. Um, and I've been in the business for a long time. Um, and here's something, guys. Traditional publishing never kept records. So if you went on the BBC, they thought it was good because you went to a million people. It never made a difference if you talked to the writer's sales. That sort of thing. Readers will pick up a book when they're ready to read it. And yeah, they may know about it. He may have gotten a bunch of readers out of that million readers, but he may not get them for six months because they weren't ready to read it. So I can't answer your question because of the events, because I don't know, because readers are so individual. You guys are lucky in the sense that you have data at your fingertips right now. Um, you're coming in, you get data immediately, but you can't always figure out the causality. And I don't think you should sign, assign the causality. Just because you did the BBC doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you didn't get readers, but it doesn't mean you got them overnight either. And I've seen writers try to quit because they tried this and it was a book, you know, it was this or that and it didn't work. You don't know. So, you know, it, the data, data can be your friend and it can be difficult at the same time. All right, unfortunately to the other questioners, we are out of time and I don't want to give uh, Craig anything to worry about by going over. Thanks to all the panelists and the conference ends in about 24 hours. Take advantage of your time. Go up to a volunteer and thank them. Go up to a person who's writing you love and talk to them. Uh, you'll regret it if you get home and you haven't done that. It's a great opportunity. Thank you all, and thanks for coming. Thank you all for those answers. It's great.